All right, welcome back everyone to our uh, second lecture today on Romans. And um, we are going to continue from where we paused, which is the end of verse two. So verse two, the apostle Paul tells us, uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, um, just want to cross-reference uh, one verse of scripture here. Uh, to, we can go to Ephesians chapter 5. And um, I just want us to look at verse 17. Uh, could somebody read that? Ephesians 5. Verse 17, please. Ephesians 5 and verse 17, please. Therefore, do not be foolish, but, but understand what the Lord's will is. Yeah, thank you. So notice what Paul writes here in Ephesians 5, 17. He says... Don't be unwise, okay, New King James. Don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Connecting that to Romans 12, 2. Prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You know, um, many times, so there is this, there, there is this, this struggle that many of us have as believers. Should I use my mind or should I not use my mind? That's a struggle, you know? Sometimes people say, hey, I mean, when we, when we think through some certain things, people say, oh, you're using your mind. Why are you thinking? You know, you must be led by the spirit as though leading by the spirit means you don't need to use your mind, you know. Uh, so there is, you know, almost like there is a certain section of the Christian church or the believers where, you know, the emphasis on being led by the spirit and they don't want to think, they don't want to analyze, they don't want to understand, they don't want to reason. And then there's the, other side where you know they just purely go by logic and there is no openness to the inner leading of the spirit now i'm not saying this is easy but i want to place this before us that as believers we need to learn to blend both we need to be intelligent people use our mind, uh, think, but we are thinking with a renewed mind. That means your mind is, is thinking according to the ways and thoughts of God. And so you are thinking, you are understanding the will of God. And at the same time, we must learn to be led by the Holy Spirit, which means I am sensitive to the voice of the Spirit that comes through the inner witness, through the inner prompting, or to how many different ways the Holy Spirit speaks. So we must learn to use both. And what we will find is that many times these are in agreement. Why? Because a renewed mind is, has been trained to think and align with the ways and thoughts of God. And you're able to know the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And the Holy Spirit is also bearing witness. He is giving you the inner witness to what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And so we must learn to walk with the, with the two. And this is a great confirmation that you 
using your renewed mind have been able to prove or understand what the will of the Lord is. And then you also are having the inner witness of the Holy Spirit saying you're being led by the Spirit saying, yeah, that's it. That's the right thing. Go for it. But the problem with the Christian church is this. They don't think. They don't want to think. They think thinking is bad. So you just get rid of thinking. And then they mess up on the recognizing the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. They're not really being led by the Spirit, but maybe led by emotions, led by own presumptions, led by their own imaginations. And so you end up with people really messed up. Because they don't want to think, and they've got their inner witness all messed up. They're being led by their own emotions, or their own... Uh, prejudices and their own predispositions or their own assumptions. It's all messed up. And so you find a lot of the Christian church that's so-called spirit-filled, so-called spirit-led. They're not thinking and they neither are they led by the spirit. They've got both wrong. And then, you know, we have a lot of problems. So I want us to understand that in the Bible, it's not wrong to use your mind. God gave us up a mind. He wants us to use it. What, he's de what he did instruct us is don't have a carnal mind, but have a renewed mind. Have a mind that has taken on or that continues to take on the ways and thoughts of God so that you can prove, so that you can understand what the will of the Lord is, and also learn how to be led by the Spirit, listen to the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, the promptings and the leadings of the Holy Spirit, and then put the two together. And you know, if your mind is renewed, you're led by the Spirit, these will go together, the renewed mind, because it's taken on the ways and thoughts of God, and the leading, the prompting, the innovators, the Holy Spirit goes together. They're not opposite to each other. They're going together. And so you'll be absolutely comfortable thinking and listening. You're thinking with your mind, you're listening with your heart. You're thinking in your mind, you're listening to the Holy Spirit in your spirit, and they're both in agreement. And it's perfect, peace. You just walk, you know the will of God. Now that's the, that's the place I want to encourage all of us to come to, you know, so to know the will of God. You are proving and you're understanding. At the same time, you're listening and being led. And you can flow together in just perfect harmony. It's like the two rails of a railway track. The train can just go smooth and, you know, you keep going uh, because the, these two rails are running parallel with each other all the time. Okay. So now we move to verse 3. Paul says in verse 3, I say through the grace given to me, to everyone that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt each one a measure of faith. So what I want to point out there in verse 3 is, he says, you know, through the grace given to me. And, I, and that's very interesting to observe. Paul knew the grace that God had given to him. So you and I must... No. What is the grace God has given to you? Paul knew that he had the grace in this particular case. He had the grace to be a leader, to be an apostle. And that's why he could speak to the church and say, hey, through the grace given to me, I'm telling you, I'm beseeching you, I am um, speaking to you. What is the grace God has put on your life? Right? It's good to know that because then you can operate in your grace and you can operate it, operate in your grace with confidence, absolute confidence. So Paul is saying, 
through the grace that has been given to me, I'm speaking to you. Right? What is the grace given to you? Know the know that, and you know, just move in it with confidence. He says, "I'm telling you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think soberly. It means be level-headed in what you think about yourself." And you know, we can apply this especially for us who are in ministry. You know, be level-headed. Um, the problem in the ministry is this. I'm kind of deviating a little bit, digressing a little bit, but I'm just bringing in the application for in, in the ministry context. The problem in the ministry is this, that when, you know, when things start happening, you know, maybe more and more people start coming to your church or attending your meetings, um, you know, and more and more people, whatever, are being blessed through what, what is happening in and through your life. The tendency is to start thinking, oh, it's all happening because of me. See, I've been gifted by God. I've been given, I'm anointed by God. I've been given, and it has, you know. So what happens then, your, your whole view of yourself gets inflated. And you're no longer thinking soberly, but you start thinking, you know, based on, just have a larger than life, um, unreal estimation of yourself. And that's a very dangerous thing. That's like the first step towards a fall when, when you let that happen. So what Paul is telling us here is, hey, all the time, you know, think soberly. Just Stay level-headed, keep your feet on the ground, and think soberly. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith, you know, so he says, look, God has given to each one of us a measure of faith. And so we, we all start out with a measure of faith that God has given to us, and then we keep growing. Of course, we keep growing. We keep growing in this faith that God has given to us, but think aligned to that. Think in proportion to your faith. Uh, stay level-headed, right? So don't get inflated in how you think about yourself. Even as God has dealt each one the measure of faith. Then in verses 5, 4 through 8, Paul begins to explain to us, you know, the functioning of the body. And I won't, I won't spend too much time on this because uh, many of us are familiar with these, with these things. He says, you know, just like the human body, the human body was four. The human body has many members, many parts, hands, feet, eyes, and so on. But, and uh, all of these body parts, they don't have the same function. Each one is serving, doing something different. And he says, Verse five, that's, that's how the body of Christ is, that uh, we have many members in the body and we are, all, uh, we are all part of the same body, but we all are individual members in the body. Uh, and so as individual members, we have differing function and we have, verse six, we have gifts and we have differing grace. So I want to highlight um, three things here, the three words here. The word function, that's in verse 4. The word gifts and the word grace in verses, verse 6, right? So in the body, all of us have function, gifts, and grace. So every person, every person, every believer, is part of the body. We are like a member of body part, and we're part of the body. And each one of us are given, have been given a function, gifts, and grace. Function is what we are supposed to be doing in the body, serving in the body, what we do. The gifts are the capabilities that God has given to us, each one is capable of doing something different. 
we have our own set of gifts or capabilities, what we're capable of. And the grace is the empowering that's on our lives to exercise those gifts and fulfill the function. So God hasn't given us a function and says, okay, do it on your own. No, he's given each one of us a function in the body. And he's given all of us the gray, the gifts and the grace needed to fulfill that function. Now, of course, we can develop the gifts and grow in grace. So that means our function and how we function can get better and better and better as we continue to develop the gifts and grow in grace. There is more grace available. Uh, James chapter 4 and verse 6, there is more grace. And the gifts can also develop. It can get sharper. It can get better. It can, you know, more mature the gift, whatever gifts God has given to us. We can get better. So as we keep growing in our gifts and we keep growing in grace, our function also grows. That means the the effectiveness of our function, uh, the the reach of our function, the the blessing that comes through to through the function, it keeps on growing. So, for each one of us, there is a fun there is functions. I, I just use the word plural. There are functions, gifts, and grace, meaning manifold grace. You know, it's 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 dive. And there is a uh, various aspects to the grace of God. But what, what Paul is telling us here in, in verses four through eight is you see in the body, we're all there. We're all part of the body of Christ, right? That's, uh, we're all there. And each one of us, every person, every believer has been given function, gifts, and grace. And then here he gives a representative list of things. It's not a complete list, but he just mentions a few. The main point he's driving at is, you know, let's use, let us use them, right? Let us use them. Whatever is, whatever is, what has been given to us, let us use them, right? Whether you prophesy, whether you serve, whether you teach, whether you encourage, whether you give, whether you show compassion. Now, whatever your function is, use it. So he's just given, you know, about seven of these things here. It's not a, a complete list. Now, these, this list is what we call as membership gifts. Membership gifts, different from spiritual gifts or gifts of the spirit. So membership gift means these are the capabilities God has put in you as a person to fulfill your function. Right? So each one has been given different gifts, different membership gifts. And these membership gifts are connected or related to the function we have in the body. And there is the grace of God empowering us to exercise those gifts to fulfill that function. Right? So this we call the membership gifts. It's because you're a member of the body, a part of the body, God has given you certain uh, gifts to help you fulfill the function. So, you, and this is just a man-made title. It's not, you know, some, uh, you know, God-given title. It's just a man-made title. We just call it membership gifts. That means the gifts God has given you to fulfill your function as a member of the body of Christ. So it could be diverse. It could be many things. You know, these seven things that I mentioned here are just representative. Uh, and so, you know, God is uh, just creative. Uh, and, and so all kinds of gifts and all kinds of combination of gifts uh, that uh, we will find in the body. Now, as leaders, what we must do is we must, do, we must encourage believers to discover their gifts and carry out their function. The more believers... Uh, um, are in actively engaged in fulfilling their function in the body, uh, to the body and for the body, uh, the more healthy and strong the body is going to be. And that's why uh, as a, uh, in, in our local churches, uh, we need to really, you know, uh, let people know that every believer, every believer has a function, 
has one or more functions in the body. Every believer has one or more gifts given to them by God. Or we would call them capabilities or skills or talents, whatever language you want to use. And every believer has been given grace from God to serve in that function. Right? So we just have to encourage them and say, okay, go ahead, find out what it is. Find out what God's called you to do. And then develop in those gifts and grow in that grace so your function can become more and more effective and uh, you know fruitful in the body. Right? So that's still verse 8. So you see how he started off with something that's very personal, meaning present your body, renew your mind. And then he's changed now to, okay, you serve in the church, serve in the body of Christ, uh, be a useful part uh, of the body of Christ. And so from there, from verse 9 onwards, the focus is more on what we do in relationship with other people, especially in the body of Christ and also to those who are outside the body. Right? So some of the things he says, Verse nine. So now I'll go a little bit fast because these are you know, instructions we are familiar with. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. That means don't pretend to love. Don't, you know, don't, don't pretend. Just love people genuinely, right? You know, put your heart in it. So love must be heartfelt. It must be genuine. You genuinely care for people, right? Let love be without hypocrisy. Stay away from what is evil, cling to what is good. So shun evil, hold on to the good things, things that are pleasing to God. Verse 10 says, you know, uh, be kindly affectionate with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. That means you give preference to the other person. You know, now here again, you know, I want to think about this in 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 terms of ministry in honor giving preference to one another in terms of ministry you know what happens is this that as god begin in ministry and i'm saying this just based on observation looking at you know being involved in the ministry circle as we go around travel to conferences and see other ministers and see how people behave and you know, what we notice is there is this tendency that as God begins to start using you, you feel entitled. You feel like you have to be given the preference. You know, if there are three preachers, you feel like you're the one who's supposed to be called up to preach because, hey, maybe you have a bigger church than the other two. Maybe you have uh, more whatever, you know, you may have more experience, you, you, you may be a better preacher, whatever it is. And there is this sense of entitlement. I'm supposed to be the one. I'm talking about ministers of God, preachers, ministers. But Paul is telling us the exact opposite. He's telling us in verse 10, in honor, you give preference to one another. So if you are among three preachers, what should you do? You mean, let's say you're, you are the person who has, you know, a bigger church than the other two, a bigger ministry, you're a better preacher, you're whatever, you're more accomplished than the other two. What must you do? Don't feel entitled, but in honor, give preference. Say, okay, hey, let me have that person. Let's let, let the other person go and preach. You know, they need more. I've done all, all of it. You know, let's, I've done as much as I need to, but let's give some, let's give the opportunity to the other person. Let's give preference to the other person. Let them go up. Let them have the privilege of preaching and so on. So that's the kind of attitude in which we must operate. In honor, preferring one another. Not the sense of entitlement and I am the better person, I am the bigger preacher, I am the more anointed person that we see today so common in the Christian 
church. Because Paul is telling us to the exact opposite of what we're seeing today. It doesn't mean we don't want to serve. We are more than ready to serve. But we're saying, look, there's something about in honor preferring one another. Okay? That's verse 10. Okay. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That means, you know, always be red hot. Fervent means to be red hot, or on fire, it's full of zeal. Serving God with zeal, with passion. And uh, you're not lagging in digit diligence. Uh, be joyful with hope in every situation. Uh, be patient or endure. Demonstrate endurance when you're going through hardship. And continue steadfastly. That means consistently in prayer. Verse 12. And then verse 13, he says, distribute to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. That means you bless others. Now he's talking about other saints, or believers. Give to their needs whatever we can and be given to hospitality. Be generous, kind, welcoming, serving. Right Now that's how, how we are supposed to be. I just want to throw this in. It may not necessarily I mean, be part of what Paul wrote here, but... You know, in this whole thing about distributing to the needs of the people, just remember you are not God. That means you cannot meet everybody's need. If you could meet everybody's need, and if you had to meet everybody's need, you would be God. But you cannot do that. Right? So don't feel under pressure. You know, of course it says you give to the needs of the people, but it means that you can only give. Practically, you can only give to certain people. Now, the reality is there's plenty of needs out there. And lots of people who come to you, you know, help me do this, do that. I need money. I need this. I need, you know, whatever. So many things. So many needs are there. And you and I need to know that, look, while the Bible does tell me to give to the needs of the saints, I can't meet every need, and God is not expecting me to meet every need because I'm not God. But I, to the, to the best that I can, and according to the grace given, and making the right choices, will choose you know certain people that I can serve, that I can help, I can give to. I don't have, I don't have to feel guilty of saying to the others, you know, I I feel your need, but I'm sorry, uh, I'm not able to help you. But I, you know, look to God and God will provide because that's, you know, that's just reality. You and I are not God, right? So while we must be generous, understand, God is not expecting you to meet every person's need, right? There are people God has assigned to your life. There are people that you need to help. And you don't have to feel guilty of saying, I'm sorry, I cannot. Uh, uh, we cannot do this. Uh, while we do empathize, we do feel your need. You know, God will take care. Right? So I'm just giving you the other perspective. And you can say no without feeling guilty. You can say I'm sorry without feeling guilty. Okay? Verse 13, distribute to the needs of the saints, be given to hospitality. Uh, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. So when people persecute you, it says, bless them. Don't retaliate, don't curse them, don't speak evil against them. Just bless them. Right? Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Now, that means you and I get into you know, what people are going through, that you rejoice and you weep. And, you know, as a pastor, sometimes strange things happen. You know, in the morning you get a message, somebody has had a baby. The same day in the afternoon, you get a message, somebody's lost a family member. And, you know, it's like, wow, you're, you know, celebrating with one. And at the same time, you're, you have to weep with 
another you know and, and it's 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 really strange thing you know you, you've got to do both on the same day uh, where you rejoice with those who rejoice and you weep with those who weep you know and uh, and especially in that kind of a uh, pastoral position it's it's sometimes sometimes i'm not saying all that sometimes it's like oh god what's happening you know emotionally it's a little difficult because there are things to be happy about there are people you know wonderful things are ha happening and they and then you're thanking god for them at the same time there are people who are going through really difficult times hardships and uh, you have to you know empathize with them and you've got to do both rejoice with those who rejoice weep with those weep now verse 16 be of the same mind one to another do not set your mind on high thing but associate with the humble do not be wise in your own opinion so that kind of brings me back to a similar thought we shared earlier in verse you know i'm looking at verse 16 is um, you know be willing to think and associate with people at different levels you know there are times you may be called to sit with people you know from high places you know they may be ceos managing directors of companies government officials you know people who are very influential so on so you walk in there, you talk to them, relate to them. And then there are times when you're called to meet and relate to people who are very simple, simple people. You know, they may not have much against their name. They may not have very ordinary, very, very simple, maybe even poor people. And they just step in and you relate to them at where they are. So as, as God's people, we should be able to do both. Yeah, be comfortable when you're in the presence of chief ministers or government officials. Just hey, they're, they're they're people. They may be in a very high rank, or they may be in a very high place. But just be comfortable with them. Uh, be confident, you know. And at the same time, you when you're meeting people who are let's say from a village not very educated not very may not be very rich or influential or whatever you just get down to their level just talk to them treat them as equals and uh, you know that's how we should be you know, able to work with people at all levels relate to them and <clears throat> treat them as equals okay Verses 17 to 21 is what we had seen, uh, what I mentioned earlier. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Right? So don't repay evil for evil. Let people do harm. Just rep repay good, as he explains to us later. And then he says here in verse 17, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. That means we must be careful to um, do the things that are good in the sight of all people. That means when everybody looks at us, believers and non-believers, uh, they should see that what we are doing and how we are doing things is good. It's nobody points an accusing finger. So provide for things that are good in the sight of all people. You know, be, or you can, if you want to put it in a simple way, be blameless, both in the sight of those who are in the church and in the eyes of those who are outside the church provide you know whatever you do do it in a way that's beyond reproach and uh, verse 18 as much as depends on you live peacefully with all men right so that that's interesting because um 
there will be times when you want to live peacefully, but others may not want to be peaceful. They'll want to fight, they'll want to quarrel, they want to accuse, they want to argue, they want to be, uh, you know, um, in, in, in strife. But you're saying, look, let's get past this. You know, let's not even waste our time. No, that how somebody else behaves is not in our control. Right? That's why he says, you know, as much as possible with you, from your side, your part, you choose peace. You don't repay evil for evil. You don't go get into retaliation. You don't get into a fight or you don't get into strife. You're choosing peace. Now, what the other person does is not in our control. If they also choose peace, well and good. It's good for everybody. But if they choose to retaliate, they choose not to be at peace, then that's beyond our control. Okay. And um, verses 19, 20, 21, that's where he says, you know, when people do evil to us, don't you don't try to, you know, meet out the judgment. Just leave that to God. Let God work it out. Vengeance is his. He says, you know, it's God who's going to uh, decide on judgment. It's God who's going to decide on uh, what, what's going to happen to people. So just, just leave it. And then instead, what you and I focus on is, okay, let me see what I can do that will bless that person. If he's hungry, I can feed him. If he's thirsty. I can give him something to drink. Uh, and I know, you know, he says, he's quoting from Proverbs in verse 20, he says, you know, it's like putting coals of fire on his head. In other words, uh, you're, you know, when you do good to somebody who's done evil, they will feel the effect of it. You know? And verse 21, we live by this. That is, we do not overcome evil. We do not overcome by evil, but we overcome evil with good. Okay, so all of this, as we saw from verse uh, 9 onwards, is just practical. This is how we live as believers. And we can do this as we renew our mind. We present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And, uh, and even as we are serving in the body, using our gifts and grace and function, we do it knowing that this is how we're supposed to be doing it, you know, walking in this attitude, in this mind. Altogether, any questions at the end of chapter 12? All good. All right. So now we get into chapter 13. Uh, I will just um, you know say a few things and then we will close off for today. We'll probably uh, pick it up in detail next week. In chapter 13, he continues to instruct believers. And he says, okay, now believers, I also want you to be in subjection to government authorities. Okay. And uh, the context is very interesting. So what do you mean by context? So here you have believers in Rome. And who is in charge? The Roman government. There are the emperor, there's the Roman emperor. There are these Roman soldiers. There are kings in various districts appointed by the Romans from the local people. And so this basically, it's a Roman government. And Paul is telling these believers in Jesus Christ, be subject to the Roman government. Now, the Roman government was not a kind or a compassionate, no, they were rough, tough, unruly. The emperor was generally a mean person, very wicked. And Emperor Nero, who took over shortly after this, was very wicked. And he, you know, he really attacked the church, the Christian church, believers, so on, and uh, eventually destroyed Jerusalem and, and so to think about Paul writing to believers and saying, be in subjection to authorities. You see today, and I'm just saying this because I, I feel there's a way for us to think here. You know, we say, well, I, 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 uh, this government is not a Christian government or this, gov this 
person is not a, a believer or whatever, and so I won't be subject to the that person is not my my leader. That's a wrong way to think. It's not a biblical way to think. Paul didn't tell the believers, hey, be subject to the government if the person is a believer. He didn't say that. In fact, when he was writing, like you mentioned, the Romans, the Roman government, the Roman emperor was in charge. And he was not a believer. He did wicked things. His government, you know, was just rough and tough people, soldiers and others. And Paul was still saying, be subject to them. So for us as believers, it's wrong for us to say, well, you know, that person in leadership, whether it's a prime minister or a president or whatever form of government that may be in the country, it's wrong for us to say, well, that person, that prime minister, that president, that whoever is not a believer, so I won't listen to him. Wrong. The Bible says you submit to those who are in civil authority with no criteria, no qualification, saying, oh, only if they are believers. No, he doesn't put any of those qualifications. So I want us to think about it because sometimes, uh, as believers, we tend to have a wrong perspective towards our government because we add in criteria that God did in place. He didn't say, obey your government only if they are believers. He didn't say that. He just said, obey your government, obey your civil authorities. Right? So we will pause here. We will pick this up uh, next week, Romans 13th chapter. We'll just get into it uh, next week and uh, go forward from there. All right, any questions before we pray and dismiss? Okay. All right, let's uh, take a moment to pray, and then we will uh, dismiss. Um, okay, maybe. Kanan, can you pray if your phone's okay? I mean, if your audio is okay. All right. All right. I'm not sure if Kanan's uh, audio is okay. All right, Thomas, why don't you pray and then dismiss us, please? Okay. All right. Not getting a response here. Uh, Siddharth, can you pray? Sir. Yeah, sure. Please, thank you. Professor, thank you for this day you've given us. I just want to pray that as we all uh, learn from our Romans, Lord, chapter 12, I pray for your grace. I pray that we will all function together in your body, Lord. I pray that will be with us, each and every one of us, guide us and lead us and protect us. In Jesus' name we pray, God. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Um, take a quick break and we'll head to the next class. God bless you. See you shortly. Bye now.